Today I want to I want to welcome everybody here, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're at seeing this message. I want to welcome you today and say that Jesus loves you. And I want to remind you that God is faithful. You know, we, uh, we've been believing God for some miracles here at Pure Heart. The last uh, few months, we've been praying for some money to come in to pay a repair bill on our van that had been sitting at the garage since December and have been fixed for over three months. And thank God the money, over $1,000, has is on the way to the garage. God provided it. And, you know, with everything being a small church and everything being shut down, our, the giving had been down. And But thank God he's beginning to bring that in because we needed a couple months rent. But I just want to throw that out that God is faithful. And that if you trust him and you walk in obedience to his word, if you give according to what the word says, he says, test me and see that I'm good. See if I pour if I won't pour out a blessing that can't be contained. And he says he rebukes the devourer over you when you give. So I want to, I want to challenge you to give and to be faithful. Even when things have been tight, we continue to give. We've sponsored two children. Uh, through Compassion International, and we also have been sponsored two missionaries. And I just wanted to tell you that you be faithful in your giving because God is faithful. And I want to give him a praise report because God is bringing it in. So, and I want to challenge you that if God's touching your heart through these messages, pray and ask God if he would have you to support this ministry. But praise God, I'm thankful that you're here today. Today we're going to continue our study in Acts chapter 22. We're going to actually read Acts 21 verse 37 and following through chapter 22. We are desiring to see a move of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something. Those, those miracles of Pentecost were not just for 2,000 years ago. They were not just for the first century church. God has called us to live in the miraculous today. And God has called us to be a people who lay down self, a people who, who focus on him and live for him 100% of the time. And that's what the early church looked like, you know, the true believers. And I want to challenge you to, as we continue to go through this study or as you go back and, and listen to some you haven't listened to yet, I want to challenge you to ask God to open your heart to believe him for more. But let's begin reading in chapter 21, verse 37. You know, we left off where Paul had been arrested. And you know, after they had done, you know, they had had him bound in chains and everything, he asked if he could speak. Let's begin reading verse 37. It says, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists into the desert some time ago? Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of, the, of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speaking to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in a Cilicia, but brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters for them to their brothers in Damascus 
and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, and, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. I, he was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance. And I saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison those who believe in you. And when the blood of of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who, who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him! He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it illegal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man's a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me if you are a Roman citizen. Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord God, we ask that you would speak your words and let only your words be spoken. Father God, I pray that if I start to go off on any kind of tangent or say anything out of my flesh, Lord, I pray that you would cause me to be mute like Zacharias. But Lord, let your words and only your words come out of my mouth. And Father, I pray that every heart would be opened and every mind would be focused on you to receive what you speak to each person today. In the name of Jesus.
Amen. You know, the whole theme as we've seen thus far in Acts, we started out with the disciples coming together and the people waiting for what was promised, the promised gift of the Holy Spirit to be poured out. And then we see the power of God entering them, the Spirit of Jesus coming into them. And we see the men who had been timid and afraid beginning to speak the Word of God with a boldness that was fierce like a lion. And you know, then all throughout this theme, we see miracles being performed. We see blind eyes being healed. We see cripples being, you know, their legs being straightened and restored, strengthened. And, you know, we see a man fall out of a window, as we read just a week or two ago, and he was raised back to life again. And we see all this stuff. But the whole theme throughout the whole book is talking about the faithfulness of the church, the power of God in their lives, and it's talking about the faithfulness of the men and women who came to give their lives to Jesus. And it's talking about how they were faithful. And something I want to mention here is Paul, is, I mentioned it, you know, I've mentioned it several times, but I want to mention it again today. Paul was a man. He mentioned it here in his testimony before these, the people. He was someone who was zealous for the law. He was somebody who wanted to please God. And he wanted to try to do everything right. He was called a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yeah, he, he did not like people of the way, which that's what the early Christians were called, people of the way. And so he thought that he was doing God a, a justice if he went out and arrested them, if they beat them, imprisoned them, even killed them. But then he met a man named Jesus Christ. He, he met a man who was a game changer, someone who changed everything for him. And he suddenly realized that the one he was trying to stop them from proclaiming was the real McCoy. He was the one who was supposed to come and uh, did come. He was the one who changed and would change things. And so this man who had been you know, walking out the law and trying to go by all these rules and regulations and, and persecuting the early church. Yeah, he would, earlier, before he had the encounter with Christ, he was, he was the one, one of them at the forefront that was taking people like, like Paul was here. He was called Saul before, but he was, they, he was taking the people that were going out proclaiming this news about Jesus Christ and he was making sure they got arrested or beaten or even killed. And I don't know about you. We, uh, we have a, as we watch the news right now, we see a lot of people crying out for blood. And does that mean that event, you know, the events that have happened were right? Absolutely not. But I'm going to tell you, even people who claim to be Christians have been crying out for blood. Does that mean that the people who did the, the horrendous crimes don't need to face you know, the legal system and everything and be tried for what has happened? Absolutely not. They need, they're going to have to go through the due process of law. You know, they need to, to be judged correctly. But the bottom line is whether they are found guilty and executed or imprisoned for life or whatever happens to them. We're called to love. And the reason I said that is when Paul was called Saul, he was out there. He was one of these religious Pharisees. He was out there beaten and, you know, and causing uh, the people of God, the people of the way to be beaten and, and imprisoned and even killed. This was a man who had the blood of, of God's people on his hands. He thought he was doing right, 
but he had the blood of God's people on his hands. But what did God do? How does God deal with people like that? He calls, his word says that he calls all people to come and repent to him. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost. And uh, let's go back, to, let's go to John 3, 16. Praise you, Lord. You know, the thing I want to get across today is this man who had been out there doing all this horrendous stuff, he met, he found something that he didn't deserve any more than you or I do. He found the grace of Jesus Christ. And do you know the Lord said that those who are forgiven much love much, but those who are forgiven little love little. In John three sixteen, and you, I'm sure you probably got it by heart, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, or eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that the deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. So God does not desire for anyone to perish. Not even someone who was a murderer like Saul. I say Saul knew, especially since he had been killing God's people, God's beloved. Paul knew that he deserved wrath. He didn't deserve grace. But yet, God gave it to him. When Paul had the Damascus Road experience, he had the real thing. He met the real Jesus. And he became an eyewitness. I know that Paul was not there walking hand in hand or side by side with Jesus as one of the twelve and all that. But yet he, in his letters, captures the gospel beautifully. And it's because he became an eyewitness to Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in him and through the encounter he had on that road to Damascus. So... Here he is, this man, this man who it says that you know, in his own statement, he said, I'm going to go ahead and read again, verse, uh, start on verse 2, or verse 3. It says, Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, Cilicia but brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As also the high priest and all the council could testify, I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I ask? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuted, he replied. 
My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. When God speaks to you, you either reject him or you do like Paul did. Paul, it says Paul cried, he said he cried out, he said, what shall I do, Lord? What shall I do? Paul, when he was Saul, he was one that actually was standing there guarding the coats, watching all the coats. It says in verse 19, or verse 20, it says, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. In the story of Stephen that we read earlier, with our church account of the church, we see that Stephen was telling about Jesus Christ. He, and while he was telling to the people who were accusing him, he didn't shrink back at all. He was telling boldly about Jesus Christ. And he told them that they had, had killed him just like they did the other prophets. And, and Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. And while he was looking at Jesus, they stoned him to death. And Paul said, I was there. He said, I was watching the coats. I was giving my approval. And the thing about it is, after that happened, he took off. And he, that's when he started going all over the place, trying to arrest people and trying to, to take them to justice, what he thought was justice. It's like it fired him up. And now the same man who brought all this persecution and trouble and even death to God's people, to the people of the way, the people who had come to follow Jesus Christ, he was now facing the same kinds of trials and things that the people he had arrested and been responsible for arresting and, and turned over to justice had to face. But he didn't sit there and say, hey guys, I'm one of you. He told them he had been one of them. But he told them something changed. I'm going to tell you something. God wants to change hearts. The only way we're going to see things come together in this nation and around this world is for hearts to be changed. And that only happens through the spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul, a murdering, murdering, abusive, <laughs> legalistic man. Pharisee. Found mercy through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that God chose to send Jesus Christ because as much as everybody's, you know, all these people's out there protesting and crying for justice and everything over the, the, the events that have happened in the last week or two and you know, even though they were wrong and they were tragic and it was, you know, shouldn't have never ha it should have never happened. If all the people that are out there crying and, and crying for blood and everything if they truly, if we look at ourselves, we see that we all deserve this, for our blood to be spilled for our sins. But Jesus Christ, he said, I'm going to do it for you. And Jesus Christ, he even spilled his blood for a murderer like Saul. And he changed his name to Paul. And made him one of the most powerful apostles that was in, listed in the army of the Lord. And so here it is. You know, instead of going out and persecuting the church, God called him and changed, put him on a different side. And I'm going to tell you something. The people that you know, we view as enemies, the people, even the people who have prejudices and all kinds of stuff that's out there, even in the systems that should protect 
people, if we can get them introduced to Jesus Christ instead of calling for their head to be hung on a pole, then they can actually become part of the solution. I say I, there again, I want to make sure you understand, I'm not telling you that the people that did the events last week shouldn't be punished by our standards, by our laws. I'm just telling you this. We serve a God who's full of grace and mercy. And as such, he's called each one of you, each one of us, all of us to come to his, to be covered under his blood. Jesus Christ loves you. And so here, this, this murderer, this, this legalistic Pharisee named Paul is now standing up and proclaiming the very one that he tried to keep the other people from proclaiming. And he's up there. Here he is around his religious peers, the people that were his comrades before, and they're the ones that put him on trial. And he's standing up there, and he's, he's not shrinking back. He's not saying, yeah, I shouldn't have been doing that. I, yeah. He's up there saying, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I was wrong. Jesus came to me. I deserve death. But Jesus came to me. And he saved me. And he, he transformed everything about it. He changed my thinking. He changed, he changed me from the heart out. And he said, I can't keep silent. That's what he was basically saying. He said, I can't keep silent. He said, when you have found the real deal, you can't keep silent. And yet here in America, so many times, we who claim to be the church of Jesus Christ, we who say we've met the one who changes everything, and here we've got a whole world, the majority of people are, are on the way to hell on a bobsled. And if you've ever seen the Olympics in bobsleds, they book, they boogie. <laughs> then I want to tell you something. Why in the world, if you know, if you have truly met the one who changes everything in your life, why do we keep silent? The more we read about the early church, the more we understand that even in the midst of them knowing that their life might possibly be required of them if they speak in the name of Jesus Christ, these men, these women we read about in the scriptures, they stand up, they stood up, and they said, we will not be silent because we have met the one called Jesus Christ we have met the real deal. It's not about legalism. It's not about rules and regu regulation. Regulation. Ah. It's not about rules and regulations. Thank God Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. I want to tell you right now, God didn't throw out every part of the law. He came and said, in me, you, you will find fulfillment. He said, in me, you will had the ability to keep it. He said, I'll change your wants and desires. Thank God we don't have to go sacrifice animals anymore for our salvation. Jesus did. He took care of that. But the bottom line is this. When we meet Jesus, when you truly have an earth-shattering, life-changing event of meeting Jesus Christ and and be an impact and be filled by the power of His Holy Spirit in your life. Then I question how we can keep silent. But he goes on to say, yeah, he tells, Paul tells about, yeah, every time he was before, you know, the people who were, you know, asking him why he was saying what he was doing and, and find, trying to find out if he was doing something wrong. Every time he told about how God, had, how he had been and how God had changed him, he gave his testimony. And he said that in verse 14, 
Well, it says he went to a man named Ananias, and God had sent him over to him, and and Ananias told him, said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. His sight came back because he was blinded because the light of Jesus is so awesome that it blinded him. And it says in verse 14, it said, Paul said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know that his will and see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. This is what Ananias told to, to Paul who was Saul at that time. He said, God has chosen you to, to hear his words, to hear the words of Jesus. And he told him in verse 15, he said, yeah, Ananias had told him, he said, you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now what you're waiting for, he said, what are you waiting on? He said, I've told you. Paul said, Ananias told him, he said, I'm, you know, the Lord Jesus is going to speak to you. He said, he's going to make you witnesses to all men. And then he said, well, what are you waiting on? I've told you what God wants you to do. He said, get busy, get moving. And I want to say the same thing to you listen to this message today. God has called you and I to go into all the world and speak the gospel. A lot of people say, oh, that was just for the early disciples. I'm going to tell you something. If you are a person who believes in Jesus Christ, you are called to be a disciple. A disciple is one who learns from the master who begins to imitate and do what the master does. And so I want to challenge you. God has chosen you through the power of the Holy Spirit to hear his voice. Jesus wants you to hear his voice. And God has called you to go and be his disciples. He's called you to go and be his church, to be his messengers to this world around you. And I want to ask you right now, what are you waiting on? What are we waiting on? Are we waiting on God to come in here and shake us like, just like maybe our... You know, somebody's shaking you, may shake you and say, well, wake up! You know, just sit there, shaking you around. I mean, is that what we're waiting on? It's time when we get serious. I'm going to tell you something. The early church, Paul and the early church was not complacent. Do you think that's complacency going through the motions? Just, you know, sitting there doing what they want to do, just going to a church service every now and then and doing nothing else? Say, well, if it's convenient, I'll come to church. Or if it's convenient, I'll tell somebody about Jesus. Do you think that's what they did in, this, in the book of Acts, the early church? No. Do you see Paul? He's not sitting there drinking lemonade and sitting in a comfy chair in the palace. He's there before the, being tried. He's before the religious leaders and the leaders of that area. And here, he's saying, Jesus is the way. I was wrong. Jesus changed me. And now I want you to know that he wants to change you too. That's what he was saying. Jesus is the real McCoy. It's time that we, the church, wake up. It's time that we stop being a bunch of pansies. It's time that we stop being a bunch of mealy mask mouths, getting offended by every little thing that happens. I'm going to tell you something. When we stop wearing our feelings on our sleeves, we're, we're going to be able to accomplish something for Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that go from church to church because they go to one and somebody looks at them wrong or says something wrong, and then they get their feelings hurt, and they may go to another church, or they may just not go at all. And I'm here to tell you something. Do you think Jesus got his feelings hurt? Or do you think he could have? had the opportunity to get his feelings hurt? Do you think Paul could have had the opportunity to get his feelings hurt? After he was transformed, he's there, and he don't care. He, he even told him when they were telling him, don't go to Jerusalem, you're going to face danger. He said, I don't care. He said, I'm even willing to die for the sake of Jesus Christ. What I want you to get to understand, what I want you to understand today is we are called not just to be saved from a fiery hell. We're not 
We're not called just to be saved so we can live our life in comfort and do what we want to do. I want to tell you right now that just as Paul and Peter and the other, other apostles and the believers that we read about in the Word of God were radically saved, I want to tell you today that God has called you to be radically saved. Amen. I mean, everybody here, is, you know, there's people you start drawing close to God, you may have somebody say, well, don't be one of them weirdos that's out there in left field. I'm going to tell you something. The ones that are in balance are the ones who are walking out the Word of God to the place of even being willing to die for their faith. Amen. The ones that are out of balance are the ones that think they can fit Jesus in a box and just pull Him out and play with Him when they want Him or when they need something. God has called us to be different. Paul. Saul became changed. He became different as he became God changed him to Paul. And I'm going to say something today. What about you? What about you? When, when Paul told him, and uh, he told him about what had happened to him and how the Lord Jesus Christ had spoken to him and spoken to him through, through other people and even spoken to him directly. And he told him that, you know, after he told him that he had fell into a trance and, and the Lord told him to leave Jerusalem because they wasn't going to accept him. You know, Jerusalem was all the religious people and, you know, he had even been a part of them, as we said. And he told him to leave at that time. And in verse 19, it says that uh, Paul said, I replied, Lord... These men know that I went from synagogue to one synagogue to another in prison to in prison and beat those who believe in you. And he said, when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. In other words, he said, these men know me. They're not going to accept me. This is after his conversion. But after, after Paul had told them this, it said the people got so upset with him that in verse 22, the last part of verse 22, it says they begin to yell, Rid the earth of him! He's not fit to live! Why were they saying rid the earth of him but Paul was not fit to live? It's because he had sold out everything, 100% to Jesus Christ. He was proclaiming 100% the truth about Jesus and about what God had shown him, how God had changed him. They, they not only shouted and said they were running around, they were throwing dust up in the air, they were just acting like a bunch of fanatics, idiots, trying to stir people up and wanting to kill Paul. <sighs> And then it says that they took him back and they, you know, they said they wanted the commander was going to have him flogged. Why was he being flogged? Why did they want to flog him? Because of Jesus Christ. It wasn't because he was just making stuff up. He had really had an experience. He, he had had an experience about Jesus. And he believed him. And he knew he was real. He, he believed him because he had seen him change him. He was a witness firsthand to the power of Jesus and the love of Christ. And they wanted to kill him. They wanted to beat him. And you know, how many times maybe you have said this, and I know I probably have too, gone through a hard time, and sit there and, and got upset and said, God, this ain't fair. I shouldn't have to do this. And yet the early believers loved Christ so much that they were even being flogged and beaten and they didn't even care. They just said, bring it on. I'm not going to change my faith. I love Jesus and that's, I know he's real and I, I wish you'd believe in him, but I'm not going to change because you think I'm crazy. God's called us 
to be faithful. You know, Rome, Roman citizens were held in high esteem because the Roman government, Rome, the Romans were in charge there at that time. And so when Paul told them that he was a Roman citizen, and when he told them that, they got scared because being a Roman citizen carried some weight, and they backed off. That wasn't the end of it, though. This is just, we're going to see as we keep going with this study, we're going to see that there's going to be more persecution, there's going to be more trials. I'm just here to tell you this, that Jesus Christ has come to change you. And he does change you. He does not leave you the same. He loves you. And I want to I want to challenge you today. If you're not saved to the point to where you're willing to lay everything down for the sake of the cross, then I'm going to tell you right now, you probably have not come to the place of surrendering everything to Jesus. Or maybe you haven't walked close enough to him for him to bring you to the level of maturity to understand what it means to be a believer. Because the teaching about righteousness means that there's going to be persecution, there's going to be trials, there's going to be all kinds of things. And it's only for the mature. But I want to challenge you, as we saw here, as we see this trial in Paul's life, as he's brought before the religious councils and the rulers of this area, and he stands firm, and he still, he never changes his story because when you have truly been changed, impacted by the grace of God and the love of God, the power of God, there's nothing you can say, but look what Jesus has done. But God has called you to understand him. He has called you to come to that place. If you're not being convicted by by the message about giving everything to Christ and, and stand up and don't even be afraid to be persecuted for the sake of the cross, that that's what the early church is about. It's not just about bless me, bless me, bless me and, and all this stuff and, and I'll do what, what's comfortable to me, but if it stretches me or gets me uncomfortable, I won't do it. I won't even come to church if I'm going to be uncomfortable with something. I'm going to tell you something then you probably aren't, true, aren't completely surrendered to Christ and God needs to get a hold of you. You need to let go of some things. That Jesus Christ has called you to be his completely. I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind who has read the story of Paul that, that Paul was truly his completely. And I'm not talking, if, you, if, you've, got, if you've got health issues or you're in a position where you need to be careful right now and this time, I'm not talking about you. But I'm talking about the ones who who are only being, only following and serving God when it's convenient for them. You are called to be the Lord Jesus Christ, child, servant, a son of God, all the time, through Jesus Christ. And I want to call you and I want to challenge you. As yeah, if you need to, go back through, listen to the message again, go back through, begin reading, you know, the accounts of the church again, Acts chapter one, you know, through. Ask God to speak to you and reveal to your heart what it means to be a believer. And I promise you this, if you're reading and studying and seeking the Lord with an open heart, He's going to show you something. He's going to show you the real Him real Jesus. So I want to challenge you to come to him and seek him and get to know him and be willing to serve him no matter where or how he calls you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, Jesus, thank you for the story of Paul. Thank you, Lord, that he Every time he's brought before the religious leaders, as we see, he continues to proclaim 
this is the way I was, but that's not the way I am now. I've been changed. I've met a man named Jesus. I've met someone who's, who loves me and forgave me despite who I, what I had been. And not only did he forgive me, he changed me. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would touch hearts today. If there's someone here who's holding out, they, they need to, to let go of some things in their life, maybe some things that, that they're holding on to and, and haven't been able to release, some things they've done or said, whatever it is, Lord, maybe they just haven't surrendered to the place of being completely obedient to you. Lord, I pray that you would touch hearts and I pray that you'd bring each person to that place today. Because, Lord, we know that we're in the last days, and you said as such, we're going to be tried like never before. There's going to be trials and things coming up, and it's only those who stand up firm in their testimony and are covered in your blood they are going to be able to stand firm to the end. And, Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you would work in each and every heart and that you would change us in the name of Jesus the name of Jesus praise you Lord